And welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Power Mondo, a limited series of interviews with mixed media artists all around the world. And they have one thing in common. They use a textile hardener to create sculptures, wall pieces, a lot of cool stuff. Today we have a very special guest and we are going to spend the, the next hour talking to her, getting inspired by her art. Oh, it's going to be phenomenal. But before we start, a few announcements. First of all, we are live right now. And the main reason we always come live is really you. We love when you participate, give your comments and ask questions to the guests. You know, anything, maybe you never saw this kind of uh, medium before. So you want to make sure you take all questions out of the way. So you can do that by uh, leaving a comment or a question on the chats or comment boxes, depending on where you're watching. We are streaming to different places. So look around, either below or beside the video, you will have a box to chat. There is the right place for you to ask questions. We are monitoring all spaces, so do that right now. And the other thing that we ask is that this is a content only uh, e event. So please share this uh, in social media. You never know who we are going to inspire to start on a new journey. Uh, so you can do that by grabbing the link wherever you're watching and, you know, posting on your feed, uh, posting in groups, like I said, it's content only. Uh, you can send emails or you can even call people and say, come on over, this is so interesting, you're going to love this, okay? And the last thing is that you're going to hear about this textile hardener that can create sculptures, wall pieces, all kinds of art out there. Uh, the name of the line of products is Power Paul. So you're going to see that our, our guests will mention that. Well, you don't find this type of products in normal stores. So pay attention because below the video, the whole time, you are going to see some websites showing up. One of them is powerpowamerica.com for the US. So if you're interested in knowing more about the whole line, that's where you go. powerpowcanada.ca Canada. You're going to see the artist's website and powerpaw.com for all other countries. We know we have many countries watching. Well, guess what? You go there, click on distributors, and you will see somebody close to you that has that line of product. It's really uh, life-changing when you see what you can make with this type of, of uh, mediums in, yeah, or incorporate into the art that you already uh, are doing. So, that's why you see so many websites going by because it, it, it is related to the country where you're watching, okay? So now it's the time for us to welcome Gwen Russo. Welcome, welcome, Gwen. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Shahar? Oh, I'm, I'm super happy that you're here right now. So I'm really <laughs> glad with that. Yes. Good. Gwen, so my first question for you is when did you get started playing with art? Oh, gee, uh, Shahar, I've always been what you might call crafty. Um, when I was a kid, I can always remember making things. I can remember sitting, making a thimble cover out of plastic lace, sewing it at the kitchen table. I taught myself to tat when I was six years old. So I've always been crafty. Um, so and I've always liked different things. Mm -hmm. Of course, I then went into um, engineering as oh. a degree and worked on the design of our can do nuclear reactors for over 32 years wow. and raised a family. So I kind of put a lot of my crafting aside for the time being, just because uh -huh. I was too busy. Um, so when I retired almost 10 years ago now, I wanted to see, well, what else am I meant to do? I loved engineering, but what else am I meant to do in life? And so I started going back to my, my um, crafty slash art type items that I love doing. And I was at the Creative Festival in Toronto. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard of that, Shahar, at all. It's a big festival, a big um, a show where people uh -huh. come to sort of um, have items that you can create with as opposed to things that are already made. Okay. And so I happened upon a booth there um where there's a gal who annette holier hook who you mm -hmm. met yes um she came in from british columbia with paverpole and i looked at it and thought oh, also kind of neat you can make things for outside as well it's intriguing so she was busy and i signed a book that said you know wanted more information she came into um to uh 
uh, or sent me, I should say, an email uh, a few weeks later saying she was coming from BC all the way to um, close to where I lived. So that was like a, a 3, 000, over 3,000 kilometer wow. um, trip for her. Uh -huh. And she was going to teach some, some projects or do a full teacher certification. And I thought, I'll check into it. And if this stuff is half as good as they say it is, I really don't care to just make one thing for myself. I'll mm -hmm. want to pass it on to other people to create and help them to learn. So the first time I ever touched Paverpole was at the t uh, teacher certification classes. Wow. And I've been working with Paverpole ever since. I do other art stuff like tatting and knitting and crochet and chainmail jewelry and all kinds of stuff. But one of my mainstays is definitely Paverpole that I focus on. That's so cool. Tatting is so beautiful. Uh, it's, it's an amazing art. So more people need to be doing that. Uh, now, tell me one I thing. How long, how long ago did you do that certification? Uh, about seven and a half years ago now. Wow. And then, then you never stopped uh, uh, after that, right? Really, I never did stop because I started doing a few shows locally, small shows, um, just basically looking for people that were interested in taking classes. Mm -hmm. And I had this wonderful gal um, who had a gallery in Milton um, walk past my one of my first shows that I was at. And a few days later, she called me and asked me if I'd be interested in putting some of my figures into one of her shows that she was doing the next week on the female form. Oh. So I quickly created some figures, put them into her show uh, for that month. And she then invited me to be her resident artist. And I was started teaching out of her gallery. And it's just skyrocketed from there. So I really, ever since I got the certification, it's been people coming to me asking to learn about it or have my figures in their, their shows or galleries. I haven't had to go out to uh, really chase after it. And I've, I've been going ever since steadily, except for COVID, of course, which has put a damper on all of us. <laughs> yes, yes. Now, I, I want to show people three of your figures. We have some pictures that we are going to show. We are going to show three of sure. them so they can get, you know, uh, an idea of your style. Because that's what I think. You, uh, people can use the same medium the way what, however, however oh, yeah. they want like we do with yarn we do with so many things but we yeah. develop our own voice into what we make and that's what makes those pieces so unique so let's take a look at the first one mm -hmm. tell me a little bit uh, about this piece i call this piece alter ego um i guess just because of the two figures being opposite and slightly different in figure the one on the uh the one side is of course the got the aquamarine on the bottom more like a, a, a mermaid's tail and uh the other one is more of a, a dressy sort of you know out there ready to dance type figure um but she was fun to make i've done her with a wooden base and a very strong wire going across between them shaped her in foil and tape and then use t-shirt material uh, with Paverpole on it to to uh, wrap it and uh, smooth it out. I think the arms were done with wrappers, which is also a Paverpole product, a very thin material to cover them. Um, but she was kind of a fun piece to do. I've done a couple classes teaching that as well, but that's fairly involved. Uh-huh. Let's see one more. Uh -huh. <laughs> This is one of the popular classes, these little birds. Um, the, the, I started out doing the little blue birds and then the ones on the other side, the little cardinals were done actually as they were a gift to, um, I mentioned the gal the, the, at the gallery who asked me to do her show. They, I did it here as a gift for her because she's a very bright personality. But they are fun to do and they're actually just done with Paverpole and Paverplast mixed together to create the texture on them. Um, and I, you can do those for outside as well, but if I do them for outside, I usually put the legs into a brick and then put, um, put clay done with Paverpole, a clay feet on them. For the weight? Uh, for the weight and also the, 
the feet on these birds that you're looking at now are wire on the bottom. The wires go down the legs, um, wrap together, and then and I don't want the wires to rust outside the feet. So I usually do them on the, the brick for weight as well as the clay feet so that it's sustainable outside. And the, the clay is done with power pole products as well. Very cool. And the last one for this moment, peace and love. <laughs> these are a bit... Yeah, these are a bit different. I call these my uh, chalk platters. You know, when you go to the store, um, even dollar stores sometimes, Shahar, and you can get these round plastic platters to go mm -hmm. under your plates at the table. Um, I think they're called charger plates. Uh -huh. That's what I've used here. And I've just taped them um, because, of course, power pole doesn't stick to the plastic. So I've taped them up and in the center, I've applied um, chalk paint. So it makes it into a chalkboard mm -hmm. and then put the, the material, t-shirt material around the outside and then a little bit of uh, highlighting with some paint afterwards. And so people can put whatever signs they want onto uh, the chalk. That's very cool. That's very cool. I like that idea. Now, you know, f uh, well, first of all, I want to tell you the countries that are watching us right now. Would that be okay with oh, you? Oh, yes, please. So we are That'd welcoming... be wonderful, thank you. Yes, the, uh, we are welcoming today US, UK, Canada, Egypt, Russia, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia, Ireland, Malaysia, Puerto Rico, Israel, and Netherlands wow. to this broadcast. Thank you so much for being here with us. And don't forget, you can ask when anytime you want a question. Wherever you're watching, you can, you can do that by using either the comment box that you have near the video or the chat box that you have near the video, okay? So, so you know, Gwen, I had the very false idea that all artists were right brain. Right. Until I started <laughs> Curious Mondo and I actually met a lot of engineers. It, it looks like uh, art and engineering have something in common here because uh, we really have several instructors at Curious Mondo. that are they have a past in engineering. Do you think it is mm -hmm. the problem solving involving both areas that, you know, they, they kind of marry really well together? Um, definitely it's a problem solving, Shahar. It's also just a fact that I think engineers um, like to create stuff. They like to build stuff mm -hmm. and um, make sure that things are done properly and correctly. And so the, that's just a fact that they like to create and do it with precision. Mm -hmm. It crosses over a lot into the art because then they can create, um, for example, the, the figures uh, whenever I do them. I tend to over design, I guess, in terms of the structure underneath to make sure they are definitely sturdy and firm um, with whatever I'm going to be putting on top of them. So they're going to hold the weight. And yes, a, a lot of, of engineers do have this sort of um, artistic side. And I found that only um, in other people, sort of in my later years of engineering, how many people actually as a sideline do have art that are in engineering. That's, that's, that's awesome, actually. Rosie Pontillo is saying, are the t-shirts aqua and purple on outer ego, or on the outer ego, or was that colored afterwards? That was actually colored afterwards. I use white t-shirts um, generally because I like to be able to make sure that when I'm putting the power pole on them, I can see clearly that I've got a, a full coating on them. So I usually tend to use white t-shirts or very light colored t-shirts when I wrap and mummify and when I dress them as well. And then I use either acrylic paints or um, we do have power colors and now new power paints that we can apply on top to give the colors. So those colors were applied with paints afterwards. That's very cool. Uh, and Bree is saying, what a great idea. Now, Gwen, tell me where you are located. I'm located in a little town called Almont in Ontario, Canada. We're just outside of Ottawa, which is the capital of Canada. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. And, and you do this as a business, is that correct? You, you teach classes, you sell product. Is that how it goes for you? Yes, I am actually the uh, regional um, uh, distributor um, or regional director, whatever you want to call it, 
um, for Ontario East. And so I have stock of product. I sell the product. Um, I teach classes in my studio. You'll see that studio tour in a little bit. It's actually a full apartment that's on the back of the house that we bought up here. We moved to Almont only two years ago. Oh. Um, so it's been very handy because I have the studio right on the back of my house now attached. Yeah. And so I can teach classes here, sell products. Um, I do shows and sell some of my products, but I also sell some of my figures there as well. And I do a lot of commissions as well. There's a number, lots of people that want you to create something unique for them. That's good. You like to do commissions then? I do. And I think, Shahar, part of that is that I like a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, I've always liked to, to have something in front of me that kind of challenges me. And if I have a commission that's supposed to be done a specific way for the, what the person wants, it gets my mind going. And, and this is the problem solving bit from engineering uh -huh. as well, because it says, OK, how can I best do this for this person and hopefully come up with what they want? So I love doing commission pieces. That's very cool. That's very cool. I like I like that because I just I just keep thinking how your brain works. And when you said, OK, how can I do this, uh, you know, in an efficient way, but, you know, going around all the specs that this person really wants, even though she might not have voiced everything, right? She might say, I want mm -hmm. a bird, but oh. you were you were breaking down that to what is really important to her. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. And sometimes it gets a little difficult because, for example, I had a gentleman one time who wanted to do one of my wanted me to make one of my large herons for him um, for his wife as a present. And I said, OK, what color power pole would you like? He, he showed me where it was going to be placed by a, a lake on his property and uh, he wanted it in darker colors. So it blends in. Um, and I said, OK, you know, you want I'll use the black. I said, how would you like it to look? Would you like it to be looking up to the sky, into the water? And, and he says, I leave all of that up to you. I'm an artist myself, so I know you'll come up with everything that I want. And I'm going, ah, <laughs> scary, because I had really no idea. And so I, I did a, a heron for him and he was blown away by it when he saw it finally. But it, it's. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's a bit challenging when you have to try and figure out exactly what it is in the person's mind that they are visualizing. Uh huh. I totally agree with you. Actually, commissions for me they le they they rise my level of anxiety, because one mm. thing is when you're creating <laughs> just because you had an idea and to a point you're making that to yourself, right? But another thing is when yeah. somebody thought about a specific piece for a specific place, for a specific reason that you're really not aware most of the time. So my level yes. of anxiety goes, <laughs> but, but I love the way you think. Well, Go ahead. I have to say my, my level of anxiety goes up, but I tend to work best under pressure. Uh -huh. um, I, I really, I always have, even when I was doing my engineering work. And so my level of anxiety goes up, but that's when I find I work the best because I definitely work best under pressure. Not when I've got lots of time to do this or that and poke and prod at that. Give me a project, give me a timeline and what I've got and let me go at it. And yeah, the pressure and the anxiety is high, uh -huh. but that's when I come out with my best products. Yeah, you don't tell that to anybody because it's no, exactly no, the only same. You, only you. Only, yeah, and because I know what you're talking about. Because when everybody <laughs> is saying, I don't know how can you, you can do all this or, or how you do it, with the, we have a lot of pressure and stress here. And I'm inside, I'm, uh-huh, uh-huh, that's what I like, that's what I like. It makes things more interesting for me <laughs> when things are a little bit in high gear, right? So I get what you're saying yep. very, very well. Bree is asking, Gwen, yeah. did you use chalk paint all over the plates or did the paint just seem to match the black power pole edges? Um, I, you, on the charter plates, there is like a rim edge around them. And so I used the chalk paint on the center portion to cover the, the, the interior part there. And then I used my black power pole with the fabric around the outer edge so that I still had the chalk areas um, visible. Very so cool. it just kind of blends on its own that way. Very cool. You know, Gwen, I know that people are crazy about seeing more pieces that you made, but 
What do you say if we take a tour around your town now so we get to know more sure. the environment where you live and create? I love that. So let's watch. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Almont. I'm going to take you on a little bit of a tour of our town of Almont. It's located in Ontario, Canada, approximately 30 minutes from the Parliament buildings in Ottawa. And Ottawa is actually the capital of Canada. Our population of Almont is about 5,000, and we date back to the 1820s. We went through a few name changes back then, but settled on the name Almont in 1855. Along with neighboring communities, we form part of Mississippi Mills and are known as the Friendly Town. The history is based heavily on the textile industry. And here you see the Mississippi River, which ran past a few of our former woolen mills. The Mississippi River is no relationship to the Mississippi River in the United States. It actually is a tributary of the Ottawa River and runs about 200 kilometers or 120 miles. It formerly powered the local mills and now it powers a hydro station. And you can see part of that hydro station here. It also facilitates many outdoor activities such as boating, kayaking, paddle boarding, and even fishing. This river forms a key component of almost everything that goes on in town. This is our Metcalf Geo Heritage Park. It has 22 samples of rocks, some dating back millions, yes, even billions of years ago. And as you can see, all of the samples are fully accessible to everyone to look, see, touch, and even sit on. In Metcalf Park, we also have a wonderful art installation. It's called Shelter Tassage, and it's created by molding faces of individuals, as you can see from the sign. Each face is then handcrafted and molded in glass and bridges age, gender, and culture. It was handcrafted by a local artist, has resided in a few different locations in the Ottawa Valley area, and has found its resting place now in Elma. This is the former Rosamond Woolen Mill. It was the largest 19th century textile mill in Canada until its closure in the early 1980s. It has since then been converted into some gorgeous condominiums and is now known as Mill Falls. There is an annex building that was part of the mill and it is now the Mississippi Valley Textile Museum. It houses many old textile pieces of machinery and we also have many shows that go on within the museum showing current displays of textile art of all sorts. I'd love to be able to take you inside However, due to COVID situation right now, that's not possible. Here I'm sitting beside James Naismith. And if you follow basketball at all, you'll know that James Naismith was the inventor of basketball. He was born here right in Almont in 1861. And he was working for a while down at the YMCA Training Center in Springfield, Massachusetts. That's now known as Springfield College. While he was working there in December of 1891, he was asked if he could come up with some sort of an indoor activity to keep the athletes there in tip-top condition during the winter months when they couldn't practice outside. And he invented the game then that we know today as basketball. You can see him sitting with his ball in his, arm, in his hand and his peach basket. Now, they didn't use in those days the rope baskets like we know in basketball today he started out using a peach basket. We're a very entrepreneurial town in Almont. We have hummingbird chocolates, which are a single source chocolatier that have won numerous international awards. We have a place called HFT, more formally known as Healthy Food Technologies. Now, you might ask, what is a healthy food? Would you believe it's donuts? They have patented a technology to get 50% less fat in our donuts and they're delicious. Go figure, healthy donuts, I love it. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention our dairy distillery. Now you might wonder what does dairy and distilling alcohol have in common? Well, when the dairies 
take their products off the milk that they get from the farmers to produce their cheeses and creams, etc. There is actually a waste product called milk permeate that they have to pay to be disposed. A couple of very clever fellows in our town, uh, they partnered together with the University of Ottawa and figured out how to distill this waste product called milk permeate down to produce a high quality vodka. And what do we call this product? Of course, it's called vodka. So it's a very entrepreneurial town. We never know what's going to come out of this town that really is great. On our main strip of Mill Street, we have some very unique architecture, as you see, and it's a little shopping paradise. You can buy clothing, antiques, textiles, yarn, flowers, unique gifts, get pampered at salons, buy some bread and baked goods, go to our butcher and get some meat to take home for the barbecue, all right within this stretch. And we have numerous restaurants and food trucks as well. And if you look closely, you might recognize parts of Almont from movies that you've seen. We have a number of movies filmed, including Hallmark movies, every year here. We are currently standing in the Almont Fairgrounds. Normally, we have the Almont Fair every year. This building is the agricultural building where we have lots of arts and craft shows and competitions. Also, there's livestock and agricultural shows and displays. The whole area is a very large farming and horse community. Very active community as well. There's something going on here almost every weekend. We have Kelp Fest, Highland Games, Bus Fusion, where this fairgrounds is full of Volkswagen buses from not only all over North America, but yes, all over the world would come here. We also have a Fiber Fest Festival, which is huge. And you can see here, we even have in the distance of the river, a little beach, which is great for kids and families. Then as we pat a little bit further, you see here the oldest covered grandstand in Canada. So Almont is just full of history. Well, I trust that you've enjoyed a little tour of Almont. As you can see, it's a very charming and very active community. Hopefully, you can come and visit us sometime. I look forward to that. Vodical and healthy donuts. You have a creative mm -hmm. town around you, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, it, it definitely is a very creative and entrepreneurial town, Shahar. You have to wow. come visit us sometime. It, it, it's gorgeous. And I actually love the rock garden. I think it's a phenomenal idea. You know, it's, I love rock. Yeah. So. Can. Okay, so Gwen, <laughs> I want to see some of yes. the pieces you have around you. Why don't you show us about sure. three of them? Okay, um, I'm going to start with these actually two for one deal here. <laughs> um, my little my little penguin that's been sitting beside me and my oh. my um, my owl. They are both done with paver sand. But I love this because they show such different texturing you can get with it. I mean, the paver sand on my little uh, penguin here, I've used the black, which is a, a more coarse sand or uh, rock, crushed rock, and the white, which is a finer. So there's not a lot, but there is some texture in it. But then you can see on my owl, there's a huge amount of texture and, um, that you can use it for to create. So I really like doing this. It was yeah, fun to beautiful. make these up. And this owl could go in the garden? Could go outside? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely, yes. Paver sand, um, there's very few products that I wouldn't put anything into the garden with, with paver pole. Definitely. That's very cool. Let's see one more. Sure. I'm going to pull out this mask. Okay. She was fun to do. Nice. Um, oh, can you tell me about there. the process a little bit? <laughs> yeah, I actually, there's different ways of doing masks, but what I like to do sometimes is rather than um, mold into a um, form, mm -hmm. to take a t-shirt, put paver on it, actually on top of the, the plastic molding form. And that's how I do this. 
And I never know what I'm going to come up with in the end when I'm doing a, a uh, sculpture, Shahar. Uh -huh. And this is a prime, prime example of that because this is really a little bit different than what my normal style is. Um, but what's kind of unique is that you can see that she's got little, I can't, I'm backwards here. Where am I here? Mm -hmm. There, little teardrop here. Oh. For some reason, there was a mark. And I just could not get that mark to go away, no matter how many times I coated it with powder pool. So I played with the varnish that we have, Josephine's varnish, uh, which is powder pool as well. And I added to it a little bit of our gold powder color. Huh. And I just applied that on top of the mark to get this little teardrop. So it's totally outside of the, the normal type of style that I do, but it turned out the way it did, and I absolutely love her. Beautiful, and I like that instead of trying to get rid of the issue, you found a way to highlight the issue, and it became mm -hmm. part of the whole story. That's, that's very, very cool. Yeah. I, also, I also want to uh, show a few more pieces that we have as, as pictures here. Let's show three more. Certainly. So people can get more of your style. Sounds great. Ah, in the I snow. put this one in, in the snow because so many people say that, oh, yeah, but I'll take it in the winter. And I say, don't leave your figures outside. So you can see here two of my herons mm -hmm. um, sitting out very proudly covered in snow. They stay out in my garden. This is at the front of our house, um, summer, winter. They definitely, I just wanted to show people that there is proof there. These do stay out in the in Ontario cold, snowy winters, and there yeah. is no harm comes to them whatsoever. That's very cool. Ooh, uh, these birds. are two little birds. Yeah, these are two little birds, similar done in style to the other birds that we looked at earlier. Um, these were a commissioned piece. A friend asked us if we asked me if I could create the same style of bird, but in the form of the Jamaican hummingbird, which is apparently the national bird of Jamaica. So I researched and looked into what they really look like. And you can see the taller one, which is the male, has mm -hmm. the two uh, feathers streaming down underneath. And apparently when they fly, these, um, these tail feathers actually rub together. And so they make a sound when they, they fly. Okay. So these are the two birds that I came up and they were gifted to this gal's mother-in-law because she was from Jamaica. Very cool. <laughs> oh, look at that. Oh, yes. If anybody has ever, well, you can see my, my one heron in the background there, but the fellow out front, he was also a commissioned piece. Actually, we gave him as a wedding gift in the end, but um, a friend of ours loves Disney. And if you've ever watched the movie Up, there yes. is a big dodo bird in that movie. And so they wanted the dodo bird to be at their wedding. Their whole wedding was themed after uh, different characters. So this is the piece that I created. And again, here comes the engineering and the problem solving. I started out with the same sort of structure as I did for my hair and standing beside him, took measurements and adapted him to become this other dodo bird figure. Very, very cool. I love it. I love it. I'm a big fan of Disney myself. When I have to tell you that yeah. I have read and watched every single documentary <laughs> about Disney. It's, it's an, not only an amazing thing that he created as a man, but the whole business mm -hmm. structure behind it is amazing. Now, you know, what, what always attracts me to this medium uh, it's basically two things. Of course, the possibility of you as, a, as an artist to have sculptures outside. We all know that the other possibilities are extremely expensive, like casting them in bronze, for example. So it's, it's not doable for a, a lot of people. And with this medium, yes. you can just, and just like you show the hair, you can put it in the garden, you can live there for years, mm -hmm. no problem whatsoever. But the second thing that attracts to me is exactly the size of sculptures that we can create. Right. When we compare oh, with other mediums that we also like, uh, like clay, for example, polymer clay, you do have a constraint of size, either because of oven mm -hmm. kilns or just the, the, 
the median in, in itself. But with, with this line of products, you can actually go crazy on the sizes that you, that you can do. So like your dodo, I, I, do, you, do you know uh, how tall he was? I think he was about five feet in the end. So, yeah, a pretty big, I am five feet, so pretty big, pretty tall. <laughs> <laughs> Andrea is saying, I have visited this town several times. It's absolutely oh. charming and beautiful. Uh, Bree is saying, I love the owl. Laura is saying, thank you for a wonderful informative tour of beautiful create, creative owl monte. Uh, hello from Ot uh, Ottawa. Is that the way you pronounce oh, that? Nice. Okay. Uh, Ottawa, yes, yes, vodka. <laughs> I have to try that. Uh, Brie, Gwen, is the mask hair or uh, is the mask hair t-shirts? On the one that I showed, yes, it is t-shirt. Um, the hair down the side of the 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 face here is actually. Um, when you when we use t-shirts, you know, we cut strips and we usually take off the seams from the t-shirts. But what I did here was I saved those thin seams and I just twisted them mm. and put them on here so that they are like little um, ringlets, almost tiny ringlets or dreads or whatever you want to call them, the hair hanging down here. So I, you don't have to, this is a nice thing too, is you don't have to sort of waste much in terms of what you're using in materials. You can use the, the different parts of the material that maybe you don't use normally and find out different things to do with them. That's what I did here was using the seams. Very cool. Very cool. Andrea, Gwen, I see lots of bird statues with you. Why birds? <laughs> well, a lot, a number of these birds, when, you, when we do the, uh, the demonstration or a little mini tutorial, um, you'll find that... I focused on them. The tutorial that I'm going, I've done for you is all on texturing. And that's why I chose different birds and that uh, you see a number of them here today. It's just the way it happened. I'm not necessarily a super bird nut. Um, they're wonderful to do, but um, I think I made five birds beforehand for the tutorial. And then the one um, giant guy over to my left here at the back, if I can see him oh. there. This yes. guy is, uh -huh. he's the one that I, he's the one that I demo on in your tutorial, Shahar. Okay. And this cool. is the finished product. This is the finished product afterwards. I am a big birder, I a bird watcher. So I have like in my car, oh. on my door, what you find are some bird guides. So I like that. Uh, now, of course you like birds and you use that as an example, but what inspires you when you create? I think it's really very general. Um, I like to create things that are unique. So something that's a bit different. Um, I, I've always wanted to create. It doesn't matter what medium I'm using. Just cure, But I don't like something that's just straight and common. So for example, even like knitting, I don't like to just do a straight piece. I'd like to have a challenge mm -hmm. and, and do something a little bit different that people would maybe take a second look at. Um, similar to like when you look at um, the big bird um, from the movie Up. Um, he's something that people will look at twice and say, oh, my goodness, I like doing something unique. So I think that's what really inspires me is doing something unique and also something that gives me, as I mentioned before, something that gives me a bit of challenge to do. Mm -hmm. Because out of that challenge, I also learn all the time. So then I can apply what I've learned from that challenge on to creating other things. So that becomes a, a um, an incentive or an inspiration to to work on some other things on so what I've learned. And, and that is a great life lesson as well, right? Because many of us, when mm -hmm. we face a challenge, we we allow fear to come, right? And and we freeze most of the time. But we should embrace challenges as actually a, an opportunity, right, to, to solve the challenge, to go through the, the challenge and in, even enjoy that, that process. Absolutely, Shahar. I mean, when, when a challenge hits me, whether it's with my, my power pole or something else in life, do I get fear from it? Of course I do. Somebody, like I mentioned about the, the, uh, the heron that this gentleman wanted me to make that um, he didn't really give me many guidelines on. 
I had fears to, oh crap, what am I going to do? You know, is he going to like it? And I always have this fear when people look at their commission pieces as to, is it really what they want? Is it what they envisaged? But if I, I have to just take a step out of that fear and move forward, because if I get stuck in that fear, I'm going to stay there. But if I move forward through it, even if I do something that doesn't quite work out properly, I learn from that. And if we don't keep learning, um, no matter what age we are, what else have we got to do in life? But, you know, sit exactly. there and twiddle our thumbs. I don't think that's what we want to do. Exactly. Always, always be learning because you're, you're always going to be a healthier version of yourself for sure. Now, we talked about yeah. challenges and, of course, we all went through a big one. Are you now be, uh, oh. being able to give classes? How, how is the, the market right now for you uh, specifically in your, in your town? Um, we in our province of Ontario have literally just opened up to what we call stage three, I guess about a week and a half ago now or so. Um, and so now I am going to be able to just starting um, teach some classes inside. We're limited in terms of the number of people that we can have in at a time. Um, and so I am waiting until um, after this interview and into the, to the month of August, I'm going to start teaching a few smaller classes, though. Um, and see how things go to make sure that we don't get hit with another wave or anything up here. But yes, I am able to now start classes. People are anxious for them, I'm finding. Uh -huh. um, I have people contact me buying product because they still want to create at home, but also wanting to start to do classes now. And it, it's, it's a great feeling that people are wanting to really go out now and do things more. So it definitely it's becoming very, very good up here. But Fingers crossed we will be able to keep on that route. I hope so. I hope so. We are, we are here are kind of going backwards now. But uh, mm. fabriliciouscreations.com is your website. So that's where they can yes. find information about in-person classes as well, correct? Yes. I actually have to update my website since COVID I haven't bothered much. But yes, if they can, there's a contact button there. They can press awesome. to contact me and inquire. Um, they can also go on to PowerPolCanada.com. I know you mentioned .ca, oh, Shahar, but it's actually, yes. actually PowerPolCanada.com, and that lists all of the, um, the regional directors as well as the instructors throughout Canada. And so if they can't remember my name of Fabrilicious Creations, they can always go on there and find me and contact my, my uh, website through Powerpool Canada. That's very cool. And what do you say we take a tour in your studio? We want to see your place. Sure, come on. Hi, welcome to the Fabrilicious Creation Studio. Come on in. You can see that we've got a large space here, ready for doing both large and small sculptures in classes, whether it be on the table or the big herons in the room. Lots of light too. Big windows, sun coming in, makes for fun classes. These are some of my sculptures. And you'll see as well, as we pan around a little bit, that there's a bit of a mix of different mediums because I've had polymer clay artists come in and do classes. I also teach tatting as well as a few other classes. So it's a bit of a mixed medium here, but lots of powder pole sculptures to show you. We also have a full kitchen, which is wonderful when I'm teaching classes. There's one of my heron's armatures ready to be created. I love these. These are masks for animals. They're done a little bit different way than we have done in the past. They're fun. And we'll gain a little more variety. Some alter egos on the left and a heart. Funny fishermen. I love using the blue pashmina as well. That's fun. All kinds of different results you can get with power pool. So this is where I do all the mucky work, I call it, with power pool. 
But as we move around the corner, this is what I call my clean room. So when we're cutting t-shirts, getting ready to mummify our figures, we work in this room. Or if I have a teaching class to do with knitting or crochet or chain mail or tatting, you'll see some things there. This is where we generally come. I also have a large TV screen so we can sit down and watch videos if we need to on demonstrations, or I can bring up Curious Mondo for students to watch. There's some sculptures mixed in with my chainmail jewelry that I make and teach. There's a couple of sculptures that are still in progress, as well as a large weaving project that I've almost done, not quite yet. These are fun little powerful chalkboards. And then I have a bunch of other circular weaving projects that I've done, and my two reindeer proudly supporting them. Some masks on canvas, as well as a, another type of mask, another Santa, and some powder sand in a sculpture. So lots of versatile things here. So thanks for coming. Come join us for a class sometime. That's an amazing space for sure, and I love those round weaving oh those pieces are gorgeous too that's very very cool uh, i have some questions for you uh elena mm -hmm. wants to know was the dodo bird painted with acrylics or with power pole colors um i believe i used a combination of those some of the colors were done with power pole colors um mixed in with either trans i know i think i used the josephine's varnish when i did the mixing with the power pole power colors um, but a lot of it also was done with acrylic paint. Okay, awesome. Now, I, I, I'm without words. If I had that space to give classes, <laughs> how amazing that is going to be, right? So, uh, talk to me about, for example, people, of course, can take classes of a specific project that you, you may put on your mm -hmm. website and give the class, but you yourself, you started with a certification. Why? Why didn't you just try some pieces and why did you, you dove right in into the certification. T tell me why and what that allowed you to do. Well, I think just by my own nature, I, I, I have trouble starting at the beginning and taking many steps going through this to that, to this, to that and learning gradually. I like to understand the principles of something and then here comes the problem solving again. Yeah. Let me, once I know the principles, move directly on and figure the rest out myself to the advanced stuff. So when I found the, the power pole um, and the potential for an instructor's course, again, I was looking at what am I meant to do after retirement? Um, I, I didn't, it didn't, I didn't have anything in mind to make sort of a sculpture for myself or just play here or play there. I did my research. I checked out the quality product and I decided that if power pole is really half as good as they say it is, then I'm all in. And if I can then pass this on to other people to be able to enjoy the process, to make art for their home as well as garden decor, I don't need to step back and just do a couple of little odd projects here or there. I'm fully in. And, and so that's what I did. I jumped right into the instructor's class. Like I said, that was the very first time I'd actually even touched Paverpole. I hadn't even seen it before, except on the website or at the creative festival when Annette was there. But it just made sense to me that this was something I really needed to get into and do. So why not jump in full force and do it? That's very, very cool. I, I love that. Now, on a normal year, you're giving classes during the year. You reach a lot mm -hmm. of people. I know you do the art shows as well. Uh, do you have any stories about 
how a life has been impacted by getting in touch with your classes, for example, because many times as creatives, we think that, you know, we do because we have a, uh, we create because we have the drive to create and we are not important, right? We are just us here in the studio, but uh, when we expose our art and mm. when we teach, uh, that, that dynamic changes because we actually start impacting other people. So I, I know this is impromptu and you didn't, you didn't plan this before, but can you tell us if your journey during seven years has impacted other people's lives? Oh, it definitely has, Shahar. I, I never imagined when I started this journey um, how it would impact some other people. Other than people just coming and having fun and getting together as groups and enjoying each other's company during the, um, the process, I found that it actually can act as a therapy. Mm -hmm. I had someone one time come, for example, with their, their, their daughter who was grown up at the time, uh, but the daughter uh, suffered from severe anxiety and depression. And, um, her mother thanked me so much afterwards because she said she's never seen her daughter smile so much during anything as she had during the class for a long time because it kind of gave her freedom and she felt that, oh, I can create something here that is beautiful. But I think the most impactful one that I can think of is um, I had a gal who was going to come with a couple of friends to make a large heron. And two weeks before the class, Unfortunately, she took a stroke mm. and this left her with some issues with her one side. Anyway, it was agreed that when she was feeling better, I would do a class for her, just herself and me. And this was a class that I was going to give to her. I wasn't expecting her to pay for it. And I wanted this to be part of her therapy for her mm. stroke. Mm -hmm. And so I, we chose the class together. She did a standing lady figure. And she was so thankful afterwards because she had thought when she had the stroke that, oh, now I will not be able to create anything of beauty anymore. And first of all, it showed her that she could because she came out with a gorgeous figure despite her difficulties. But it also helped her because when you're, you have a stroke or anything like that, you know, your therapists and your doctors would tell you, well, you have to strengthen this arm and you have to do these exercises and that type of thing. But this, by doing this, um, making this figure with her hands and her arms and moving, she was able personally to feel, oh, I can, st I, I need to improve in this way. I'm finding now that my arm isn't doing quite what I want it to do here. And so it helped her in a form of self-discovery as well mm -hmm. to learn how what she needed to do personally to, to sort of help herself. And she was absolutely in love with doing this. She did come back with her friends a, a few weeks later, a couple months later, I guess it was, and did large hair and with a bit of assistance. So it's, it's really can be a therapy as well as any art form can. Yes, amazing examples. And it's really, uh, like you said, is a self-discovery in the process that you do. Mm -hmm. uh, you understand that maybe what you've been told as, oh, these are or they are going to be your limitations, they're not necessarily true because you can go through mm -hmm. the, the we, we use the word right. challenge and that's exactly what it is when you embrace the fact that you have a challenge and you uh you embrace the mission of going through it you find that you can overcome many many things right and and the mm -hmm. mental part of it of creating art and and being taught art and teaching art uh is is also amazing because like you said with the girl a smile can mean a lot of things, right? That the whole Absolutely. the whole thing inside her was shifting as she was creating and she was mm -hmm. finding a new her in that process. Uh, and I think I think yeah. your words were fantastic because really we are, we need to understand that we what we make it's not important because it is beautiful or not. It follow the process to the teeth or not. It is important because it impacts. And I think that yes. that's a better mission to have than, oh, I have the perfect sculpture. Uh, that's cool, mm -hmm. but 
that you see just just but sometimes by teaching by being together you can change the way somebody's feeling about themselves take away some yeah. fears right absolutely so what do you say if we get our hands dirty now and go do a tutorial sounds like fun to me shahar okay so let's watch i'm excited about that okay i want to talk a little bit today and show you something about creating texture so often with Paverpole, you know, we use t-shirts or knit, cotton knits to make texture. We often use the Paverpole products such as Relief Decoration, which gives a wonderful lacy texture to our sculptures. Or if we want a rougher texture, we'll use the Paver Sand. Those are all great, but I want to think a little bit outside the box at the moment. What if we got around the house that we just normally would throw away that we could use? or what do we get when we go for our walks? Is there something that we could pick up on our, just off the ground on our walk? If we go to the farm, neighboring farm, for some produce during the week, is there something different there that we could find? So I want to look at some of these types of components to go in for producing texture. And I'm going to show you three application methods, very similar, but still three various application methods that I use. And I have named them dunk and plop, dab and place, and grab and hold. You'll see why I've called them those as we go through this presentation. These are the samples that I've produced to show you the different textures using the applications. So let's start talking about them. This is the first application that I call the dunk and plop. This fellow here is done in the bronze paver pole. And to create his texture, I've used eggshells. Well, most people use eggs in their cooking or in breakfast. And when I've had them, instead of throwing them out, I've simply rinsed them, put them on a rack to dry, and then collected them over time. So they're handy to use anytime I wanna get this type of a texture. As we move over, this proud fellow swinging here, he's done with a mix of the bronze and flesh tone power pole mixed together. And to get his texture, which you can see is a little spikier than the previous one, a little more curly, what we've used is wood shavings. Wood shavings are readily available if you have a friend who does woodworking or somebody that has a hamster or guinea pig as a pet. Lots of places have wood shavings. Now this fine Strutton friend, he's done with gray paver pole. And for him, we have used hay. So you can see I've taken the pieces of hay as they come and I've cut them into shorter pieces. And for the head and the chest, I've used some of the toppings of the hay, the seed heads. Depending on the variety, they may look slightly different. I think I've got a combination of Thompson and Brome here or something. Lots of fun. So as we move to the next application, these two birds nicely demonstrate that. This is the dab in place. This fellow is done with a gray paver pole mixed with flesh. So again, it produces a much lighter gray than the previous bird, than solid gray. His wings I just love. He's done with pine cones. I've actually taken the scales individually off the pine cones and applied them. And his headpiece, I've just taken one of the tops from a pine cone and used that. Same uh, method, same application method, dab in place. His wings and his body, his back, I've used seashells. Go for a walk along the beach, you collect seashells. Go walk into a park, you collect the pine cones from the previous bird. Easy to find. 
Now for the last application, which is the grab and hold, that's how I got this fun texture here. If you've ever heard of agave, which is a sweetener that you often find today, the actual leaves, I believe it is, from the agave plant, from one of the agave plants, is used to make sisal, sisal, sorry. Sisal is these long fibers. They're very, very strong, and they are twisted to produce a twine that is used on farms for baling. So when you go and get your produce at the local farm, ask them if you can have some sisal. We'll be splitting that and I'll show you how to do that to get this fun texture. So such diversity as you can see in the resulting looks for all of these birds, just by thinking outside of the box a little bit. So here's the materials we're gonna be using today. We're gonna to use a paver pole and paverplast. And you're gonna need some small containers to mix them in, as well as some stir sticks so that you can make sure you have a very smooth application of your paver pole and paverplast mixture. I like to use bamboo skewers. You don't have to, but I find they are helpful in placement of the uh, texturing. I have brushes and spatulas here Sometimes I use one, sometimes I use the other. It just depends on really the medium I'm using and how I'm applying it. We're gonna use a water bucket for your hands as well as one for brushes and an old towel that I really don't care about because that's gonna make sure that we have nice dry hands and dry brushes after we've rinsed them. We do not want to get excess water into the paper pool. If you prefer, you can use vinyl gloves. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Paver pole is very environmentally friendly and non-toxic. It will come off your hands without too much problem. So it's really not a, a, an issue if you don't want to use gloves. I'm going to use a blow dryer today. And of course, we need to have our texturing component that we're gonna add into the paver pole paver plast mixture. Now, of course, the last thing we need, but not the uh, least thing, is a sculpture we're going to work on. We're going to work on this fine feathered friend here today. He is done with a mixture of the gray and flesh tone power pole. He's shaped with wire and foil, mummified with hockey tape. I've applied two layers of power pole and three layers of power pole plus power plast because I wanted to get a nice smooth shiny appearance to him. Now it's time we get to play. We're gonna start off by using the first technique, the dunk and plop. And I'm gonna demonstrate that using the wood shavings. So let's start by taking some of our paver pole and paver plast. I've already pre-mixed a one to five ratio of paver pole and paver plast. It's a little bit thin, so I might still add a little more paver pole or paver plast, I should say. So let's pour some into our other container here. And I'm just going to wipe that off so I don't dribble it all over the place and make a total mess of things. One thing you always remember is when you're not using it, please put the lid tightly back onto the paver pole. Otherwise, it will start to dry and form a skin on the top. Okay. So let's now take our paver pole. I'm going to add a little bit of paver plast in there just to thicken it up a touch because I don't want it to be too runny. You can see it's still quite runny now. I'd like it to thicken up just to be kind of a, oh, a, a soft, soft uh, sour cream type texture. So mix it in well, because we don't really want a lot of lumps in it. One thing you'll find is that the one to five mix will vary sometimes with the, the weather outside, depending on whether it's rainy or very dry or hot out. I'm not sure why, but then I'm not sure why it acts funny when you're making meringues either. But it does. So that should be good enough. And you can see that it's not running as much. It's kind of dropping off there now. So what I want to do now is take our wood shavings and I'm going to dump them in. I'm going to take quite a few in there because I want lots of good texture. And I'm literally 
dunking them in, hence dunk, the dunk and plop, mixing them so that it's very well covered. And you can see too how that's thickening up. The wood shavings actually are starting to absorb some of the Paverpole Paverplast mixture. So that looks pretty good, okay? So now let's take that, and I think I'm just going to use my brush for this one. We're going to take that, and I'm going to apply a little bit of Paverpole onto the, oops, I dribbled there, too bad, onto the wing, just to help with the sticking. And then I'm going to take my mixture and I'm literally going to plop it on there. I want a good thick amount because I want lots of texture. Now, you notice as well that this is on the vertical here. I am definitely right away taking my blow dryer and I'm just going to, on low setting, blow dry a little bit to help that to stay in place because I definitely don't want it falling off totally. All I'm doing is just getting it to set. I'm not getting it to dry totally, okay? It won't take but a couple of minutes. A little bit's falling off, but that's okay. We've got lots. But you can see now that it's starting to stay a little firmer on there. Usually you can start to see when the color starts to change on the powder bowl as well change slightly when you're getting to get a little bit of a skin on top and that should be good enough so that is what I call the dunk because we dunked into here and we plopped it onto the bird all right on to the next one which I fondly call the dab in place and again we're going to use our pepper pole mix this one though, I want a little thicker still. So I'm not gonna put quite as much in because I'm not going to be using an awful lot right now. So the difference between the powder pole here is simply going to be the thickness with the powder plast. So I'll add about the same amount as I added in last time, but as you can see, I've used a lot less of the powder pole just for this demonstration purpose. So again, I'm gonna mix it in. If I need to, I can always add some more powder pole in. This is getting a little thick. I guess I skimped a little bit too much on the powder pole. We're just gonna add a little bit more in there. Because this time I'm looking for more of a, a, um, a regular sour cream type texture, not so runny as we had last time little bit thicker because I want it to help to really adhere the um, pine cones onto the bird. So you can see here it's not even dropping off like it did before. It's more plops and it's a lot thicker. So that looks good. So I'm now going to take some of the pine cone scales and this is where I call the dab part. I'm actually going to dab it all over it. It's too difficult to try and make sure that I get total coverage because I'm actually going to layer these on the bird. So afterwards, I have to, I, I would be too difficult to make sure I get total coverage. So I'm going to do that. I'm just going to put a dab on where I'm going to place this. And then I'm literally going to place. So there's dab in place and I can then take some more and continue and just build it up and overlap to get a real nice feathered effect. So I hope you can start to see how I created the wings on the other bird that I showed you earlier. This is where I find my skewers very handy because I can then adjust them where I really want them to be. And 
then I can just continue to build them up. Each one's a little bit different because pine cones are all a little bit different in shape, aren't they? The scales. And you can see I can just overlap here again on top to get a really nice effect. I'll just do one more just so you see. Put a little bit more on here to help it to adhere. Getting it all over my fingers here. And again, I'm gonna use my skewer because it tends to stick to my hands otherwise. Should have my other skewer here. Anyway, there we go. And I'll just let that dry. Now, again, I want to very gently, because I don't want to disturb them, use a little bit of my blow dryer air just to help to solidify them so that they're gonna start, start to slip off. Because as you build that up, you'll find that they will start to weigh on each other and slip a little bit perhaps. I can see the powder pole starting to get a bit more drier look there, and that's fine. That just tells me that the skin is forming on it and it's going to stick. Now I'm just going to rinse my fingers here because I've got powder pole all over them and that's fine. But when I do the grab and hold for the next one, I'm going to put my gloves on simply because this can get very mucky for me. Again, if you don't want to use vinyl gloves, you do not have to. Now for this grab and hold, I'm going to use an even thicker Paverplast Paverpool mixture. I've already pre-mixed it here. And you can see, this is almost like a plaster. It's so thick, okay? It's not really dripping off at all. It's just like a solid, like a plaster. So for this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take and I'm going to cover the tail feather here. I don't want it to be dripping off a lot. I do have plastic on my base here, so it really is fine if a bit does drip. But you see, I don't want it to run off. I want it to stick onto the tail feather. Now I'm going to take the sisal and I'm going to literally split it into all of those wonderful individual fibers. And you can see there's an awful lot of them, awful lot of them that are pulled together to make this one continuous piece of twine. If I just put it on, it would hold, but it tends to have a bit of a memory. See how this piece is curled? I can't easily curl it unless I really hold it onto the piece, or uncurl it, I should say. So this is why I say it's grab and hold. So I'm literally gonna take this and grab it, and twist it around as I want it onto my tail feather, and I'm gonna hold it there. Now this is where you have to be careful. Don't burn your fingers. I'm gonna use the blow dryer because I want it to stick. Put it on the low setting again. But I want to make sure this sticks because that's why I'm holding it here. But you can see it doesn't take an awful lot of time and it's holding pretty good. So that's the grab and hold. After I work on this bird and finish him off, I will then let him dry for about 24 hours 
and then I'll come back and I'll apply, hmm, I may apply one or maybe even two coats of the original Paverpol and Paverplast one to five ratio mixture, or five to one, I should say. I would let it then um, sit for a little bit longer before I put any um, paint or varnish on, and then at least two weeks to cure before I would put it outside. That's the way I've used these three techniques and defined them. You want to put the varnish on to create a good uh, UV protection of your bird afterwards if you paint it because you don't want the paint to be affected by the UV rays. I hope you've enjoyed this. This is just the start as you can tell but you've understood as well how to do the finished birds. I want to take this opportunity to give you a bit of a tip. If after you've done a figure, you have some leftover Paverpol, Paverplast mixture, it could have some of the um, hay in it or something mixed into it, don't throw it away. Keep it and let it dry out because you know what? You can easily, off of your little metal containers, peel off pieces. It comes off wonderfully well. And just think of the fun places that you can go with these. Putting on to your birds, putting on to other figures. I actually have some here that I was using with hay in it. And if I leave the lid off to let this dry out, which I will do, I will be able to peel right off the plastic this full circle, which will have the hay texture in it. Then I can use this as a skirt. I could maybe use it as a cape on the lady figure, or I could break it into pieces and put it onto my birds or different things. Don't waste it. It's amazing what you can do with just leftovers. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this little presentation. And I wanna challenge you to think outside the box. Look at the potential of texturing materials of different types in a different way from now on. Experiment with how to use them. Play with it. But the bottom line is, by all means, have fun. I'd love to see what you can come up with. I love the different textures. And if there's something that really attracts me as well, is that you can work with any medium. That's amazing. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, the leftovers, that you mentioned right now, that was a first for me. Never thought about it. Oh. And it's a great way. Yeah. Very cool. Oh, yeah. There's really no waste with this product. I mean, it's just fabulous. Even if you've got a piece of material that you have put power pole on at some point and then haven't used it, don't throw it away. Put it on a piece of plastic, let it dry. You'll find someplace else another time that you can use it and give you some great effects. Yes, it's, it's a great idea. Uh, I have a, a few questions. Anna is saying, Gwen, amazing studio. I love your work. So talented and such beautiful pieces. Uh, Rosie Pontilio, the you. hay makes a very interesting texture. And ma'am, Gwen, how do you mount your lovely sculptures to their brick bases? Um, well, I brought along here, the, I brought over the, the bird that I had that uh, I actually demoed on. So you can see the final um, effect of the bird, okay? So there's the bird itself, okay, with all of its glory. Yeah. But in terms of the, the mounting, I drill, or actually I get my husband to do it. <laughs> um, he drills holes into the brick where I tell him to. And then I have um, threaded rods that I put into there and I secure into there. Sometimes I use a mix of Paverpol and Paverplast, and sometimes just depending on if I feel like it, I use a, um, a very strong um, construction glue, but generally a Paverpol and Paverplast is enough to secure it in there. And they'll let that dry, and then the next day I just, I can um, put my sculpture together, and then I usually like to put feet or something on the bottom, as you can see here. Mm -hmm. It just hides the uh, pole going into the brick. And you do that with wire, the feet? Uh, the, the, the feet, no, no, Shahad, those are just done, it's called rose clay. Oh. Mix from Paverpole plus Paverplast, and then you add into that some art stone 
so that you can get a, um, a clay out of it. Got a it. similar texture to you would do with a, a polymer clay, but it's all done with the power pole, totally. And that's what I do the feet with and stuff. And actually I got, um, you can use it in molds as well. So for example, on this little fellow, because I, I didn't like the way the, the base looked with the, um, with the pole going into it, the rod, uh -huh. I had some molds with some feathers and I put the rose clay, molded these feathers, and then just put them onto the base and put a little bit of paint on them to, to highlight them. That's so cool. That is so cool. Uh, uh, Elena, when you say one to five ratio, what do you mean? How much power pole, power blast? Okay. The, the rule of thumb, uh, so to speak, is five parts of power pole, one part of pavroplast, and that is by weight, not by volume. So um, basically, if you have a 500 gram bucket of your power pole, which is your small buckets, very small buckets, then you, if you want to use that whole bucket area, you would add in 100 grams of the pavroplast. But that's just a rule of thumb. As I said, mentioned before, I like to just do it, gauge it to the consistency that I feel is proper because in some conditions of weather, I find that the five to one, one to five or five to one is not enough. Sometimes it would be too much just depending on how the weather impacts it at times. So, but that's the rule of thumb. Why five parts of power pole to one part of power plast by weight. Awesome. Mary Herman. Uh, why can't you just dip a few in the power pole instead of painting it on? I assume she's talking about when I did it for the, uh, what I call the Davin place. And it's because I want the, you could do that, but it would be, it's, I'm using a much thicker um, power pole mix with the power plast to do that because I want to make sure that they stay on when I apply them and cover well. And if I just dip them in a thinner power pole mix, then it probably wouldn't stay as secure. So I like to paint that on because it's a thicker uh, consistency. Very cool. Some of your, our friends here, they want to see the golfer figure behind you. Is, can you show? <laughs> Certainly can. Where is he? Oh, he's over on the other side of me here. <laughs> He was fun to make. His uh, pants are done with, um, with t-shirt, mm. but then his shirt is actually done with a, um, a cotton sock. Okay. So I've used, you know, the, the sleeves are part of the cotton sock and the body as well. Very and then the hat is just a hat that I had found um, probably in a thrift store because I never look at things in a thrift store the same and after I've discovered power pole and uh, put power pole on his hat. Awesome. And man, Gwen, that leftover hay power would make a great nest. Mm -hmm. Bri, you are very inspiring. I have a whole page with drawings for projects. Thank you for sharing <laughs> with us. Uh, Rose wants to know if you have an Instagram. Uh, it's so, it w was so inspiring today. So besides your, your, your uh, website, fabriliciouscreations.com, how else can people get in touch with you? They can find me on Instagram under Fabrilicious Creations. That is actually my handle on Instagram. Um, of course, uh, my name is there as well, but the name of my, my uh, Instagram site is, is, is Fabrilicious Creations. So that's, they can find me there. They can find me. I don't have a Facebook page, but they can find me on the website. Or if they look on uh, the Paverpool Canada page on uh, Facebook, sometimes I post uh, some of my sculptures on there. That's very cool. And any final words for our friends? I just like to tell people that don't be afraid of trying things and going for it. Uh, it doesn't matter what you feel your capabilities are or even what age, just a quick example. I did a class of grade twos 
Um, I actually had 80 students that were um, separated into four different classes of 20 students each. And I had 20 minutes with each group of 20 with some parents, but not all. Okay. And we made these Christmas decorations. So, you know, a grade two, um, I've had people that are in their 80s doing sculptures. Um, I've had, as I mentioned, people that have some, some maybe physical or mental issues doing sculptures and loving it. Don't hesitate to try it. It's a wonderful medium. It lasts. It's strong. Um, I've even had it withstand a tornado at one of our shows, believe it or not. That's another really? story, Shahar, I should share oh, no, with you sometime. I wanna, I wanna hear that. So you were doing an art oh. show and a tornado came yes. through? Really? Yes. Um, Andrea Chan, who's another, who actually is part of Paul Canada these days. You've met Andrea as well. Oh, yes. Um, uh, she and I were doing a show in Barrie, Ontario called Kempenfest. And Barrie is prone to having some vicious storms at times in the summer. We were out there with our tent and our displays for Paverpole figures. And I kept watching the sky because we knew that a storm was coming in. Um, and I looked out at the one point and there was this pukey green hovering over the sky in the distance. And I thought, oh crap, here it comes. So we quickly, I told Andrea, and we started putting all of our sculptures into the center of the tent as best we could, move the tables in. Um, the winds were whipping up. Andrea was hanging on to the, the tent like crazy. She thought she was gonna get blown away, just like on The wow. Wizard of Oz. Um, our stakes had literally, from staking down the tent, had pulled out of the ground and were thrown like 12 inches away from the tent. I had to go outside while Andrea was holding the tent down and rehammer all of our spikes in again. We quickly, quickly closed up and left. And that storm came in, the tornado came in. Um, it was very, very bad. And the next morning when we went back, we were driving along and we were just looking at the devastation. Tents were blown out into the Kempen, um, Kempenfest, or Kempenfield um, River or lake that was there. Um, people's, um, Items, products were thrown all over the place. Uh, a lot of people lost almost all of their stock that they had at the show. It oh. was really bad and we were in fear and trembling. And when we got back, somehow our tent was intact. Wow. Everything inside had gotten totally soaked. But being Paverpole, it really didn't matter. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have any sculptures that broke apart or had any damage to them. Um, I had a couple of sculptures that were done with transparent and you could see there was a bit of moisture under the transparent that made it turn white, but it dried up within a few hours the next day and you wouldn't have known anything had happened to it. And we had nothing lost from that tornado. And some of the um, other vendors, and a lot of them actually had their tents totally torn apart and all of their products gone. So wow. it's, it's a, it just was proof to me that it's very, very good product, very sturdy product, no problems in high, handling things outside if you structure them well properly to begin with. And um, it really was proof of the pudding, just how good the stuff is. That's amazing. That, that is really incredible. Uh, and it's amazing how the life of our, an artist is never boring, right? There's always something <laughs> happening. I, I went through a windstorm once Absolutely. in a show and the tent mm. beside me had glass art. It was so oh. sad, so sad to see. But yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, I'm very excited to talk more with you. I bet we could go for three hours here, right? Uh, oh, it, it's amazing the inspiration <laughs> that you bring to people and you know all the best now going back to personal classes I think people are going to have a blast and you know there's so many reasons to travel to Canada right and uh, it's such a beautiful country Absolutely. and your town is is gorgeous and then they can try Thank some you. vodka the chocolate the chocolate you <laughs> need to send me some you know I, I'm, I'm, I'm self-entitling myself as a connoisseur just to get some. I want to see it. Super, super no problem. <laughs> so thank you so much, Gwen. 
And of course, thank, 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 thank you as well for being here, interacting with us and spending this amazing time with us, getting to know more about Gwen, about the medium and all the possibilities. When you think about how many possibilities are there, when she started getting the shavings and the, the wood shavings and the hay and I said, oh, I mean, it's really unlimited what you can play with together with this, which just makes the fun even even more now don't forget below the video this is your last chance now to write that down fabriliciouscreations.com is gwen's website go there check it out and of course uh, some place there is a place for you to submit your email or write an email ask her about in-person classes you see powerpowcanada.com if you live in canada look for somebody close to where you are because they have distributors all around the country so go check it out you may take a class get some product or even get a certification so you can start teaching this to other people as well in a, in the us powerpoamerica.com powerpoamerica.com it leads you right here to us where you can also get products certifications and of course the courses and uh, powerpoll.com, if you live in any other country, click on distributors, you're going to see a list of all distributors around the world. There will be one near you. And, you know, go there, check it out, because it is worth it. You're going to fall in love with all the mediums that you can use with this medium, right? And don't forget that all the interviews of Pavermondo, they stay where they are. So I don't know where you're watching. You might be at pavermondo.com watching. You might be on Facebook. You might be on YouTube. You might be on Twitch. We are there too. So whatever you're watching, uh, it stays there for you, so we enjoy this as many times as you want. But we have many other interviews at pavermondo.com. Pavermondo.com will lead you to other people you, we have in Australia, we have in New Zealand, we have, of course, uh, many in Canada, uh, South Africa. Yes, the interviews are there for you, so watch them, get inspired, but most of all, start making, start creating. Uh, like Gwen said, it does wonders for you, for your body, for your mind, and, you know, just bring happiness into your life. Thank you so much for being here with us. I hope you join us again. Bye-bye.